P. Allen Smith's Garden Home is brought to you by Proven Winners. Proven Winners, found in their distinctive white containers at fine garden centers and the Home Depot. Aromatique, makers of decorative fragrances to create a distinct ambiance for each room in your home. More information at aromatique.com. Crescent Garden, designers and creators of functional decorative products for your home and garden. More information at crescentgarden.com. And by Bonnie Plants. When I was a kid, my dad grew so many vegetables and herbs that we had to give most of them away. As I got older, I realized he didn't give it away because he grew too much. He grew too much so that he could give it away. And by the makers of Job's Organic Fertilizer, now in spikes, granular, and water-soluble formulas. EasyGardener.com. Your journey starts in Arkansas, the natural state. Vacation planning kits available at Arkansas.com or 1-800-NATURAL. Yes, now I see. Ah, now I see. Yes, it's becoming clear. Yes, yes. Now I see. It's becoming very clear. Well, the future is looking bright. Hi, I'm Alan Smith. You know, you don't have to be a fortune teller to be able to plan ahead. Some of the best ways to predict the future is to take a look at the past. Today, we're going to show you how to start planning for what's coming up next. A chicken? Really? Yes, chickens are cute. And I think we would all agree that the eggs are quite delicious. And they're not so bad with a little garlic and rosemary either. Here at the Heritage Poultry Conservancy at Moss Mountain Farm, there's a greater call to action happening. You see, what we're trying to do is help save these birds from extinction by putting them back to work. We're not the only ones dedicated to the preservation of heritage farm animals. In fact, in the smallest state in the country, Rhode Island, there's a farm where they're making big waves toward preserving some of these important animals. Carved out of the hilly landscape of Newport, Rhode Island, is a historic farm that very few people have seen. And the dwellers of this property play an important role in the preservation of heritage livestock. So SVF Foundation, or Swiss Village Farm Foundation, was developed in the early 1900s as a working farm. Arthur Curtis James and his wife developed this property to house his prize-winning herd of Guernsey cattle. And it was a working farm until the 1940s. It changed hands several times, and it was purchased in 1998 by Mrs. Dorrance Hamilton, who is a philanthropist, and she's done a lot here in Newport. She wanted to preserve the property, and she collaborated with Tufts University to set up this nonprofit foundation which preserves endangered breeds of livestock. It happened at that time, there was the mad cow disease was going on in England, and so many animals had to be destroyed. It made me wonder how on earth, if everything was killed off, how you'd ever breed back these wonderful breeds. We're losing breeds at a very alarming rate right now. The industrialization of agriculture has been going on for about 20 years, and it's been consolidating all of our livestock to produce more and more at lower production costs. And what that's meant is the consolidation of all the breeds into one location, so it's cheaper to produce a lot of food, but it means we're relying on only one breed per species, and all the other breeds are becoming lost because they don't fit into that economic system. In collaboration with Tufts University's Cummings School of Veterinary Medicine, 
The SVF Foundation brings livestock from all over the country. Veterinarians come on site and work with livestock and laboratory teams to collect genetic samples from the animals which are cryopreserved. The hope is that by saving this genetic material, if needed, they'd be able to bring that breed out of extinction. For birds, however, it's just not that simple. Well, one of the things, you know, with our preservation program with animals, we've had a great success uh, cryopreserving almost 80,000 samples to date, uh, but we really haven't figured out how to get those giant chicken eggs into those tiny little straws you saw. Since cryogenics really isn't an option for poultry, any avian species such as chickens, ducks, turkeys, and geese, awareness is really critical. Like the Swiss Village Farm Foundation, the Heritage Poultry Conservancy here at Moss Mountain Farm is dedicated to finding some of these rare breeds from across the world and breeding them to the standard of the American Poultry Association standard of perfection. We work hand in hand with scientists from the University of Arkansas, poultry experts from around the globe, as well as American Poultry Association certified poultry judges. How big is it supposed to be? Type, shape, dimensions, the back's supposed to be long or short, the tail angle is supposed to be an open tail or closed tail, how the wing carriages, and things like that. Over the last 10, 15, 20 years or more, we've seen a, a pretty a dramatic decline in those people that are raising them. We're seeing fewer and fewer of them shown at shows. We don't know that some point in the future, hopefully this doesn't happen, that we get to a point, hey, we've got to go back and get some new genetic diversity. We have to go back to our roots and recreate some. If we don't have our roots, we can't do it. As part of our outreach program, we hold poultry workshops dedicated to educating enthusiasts and empowering them with the knowledge and skills to maintain these heritage breed populations. But I have to say, one of my biggest pleasures is reintroducing these breeds into the population through the eager hands of future generations. This girl knows how to handle a turkey. So one of the best things we can do as farmers, as consumers, is really to preserve poultry on the wing, where you're not able to freeze them cryogenically and reawaken a species if it was to go extinct. We really need to keep them going and we really need to give them a job. You know, a lot of the reasons the animals here are in danger of going extinct is because they don't have a job, the way uh, agriculture has progressed. And we've learned from history, like for example, the potato famine in the 1840s, that when you rely on a single source of nutrition, when something happens and a disease or a blight hits that one source of food, you can be in real trouble. And so it's made a lot of economic sense to consolidate all of our agriculture into a certain number of breeds, but the diversity that we're trying to protect here at SVF Foundation is what's gonna carry us into the future. There are about 5,300 tracked breeds of livestock worldwide with about 20% of them endangered of becoming extinct. The Food and Agricultural Organization of the United Nations reckons that about one breed per month is being lost. So let's put these animals to good use. Let's put them back to work again. So how can you help? Well, you can support conservation organizations. You can buy local. You can support a local farmer who's raising heritage breeds. And you can even be a little adventurous. You can keep some of these breeds for yourself. So do your part in securing greater diversity and let's save these heritage breeds together. What do you say, little guys? To ensure a vital and prosperous future for your birds, you gotta keep them healthy. Let me show you what I mean. Everybody who raises a few chickens understands the value of those delicious, fresh, homegrown eggs. But in order to have plenty of eggs, you need to have healthy chickens. And when I start, particularly with my baby chicks in the spring, one of the things that I always use is a vitamin and electrolyte mix. It seems to give those day old chicks a little bit of a boost. They're healthier and more robust and it gets them off to a good start. Now whether it's baby chicks, juveniles or adult birds like these, you always wanna make sure that they're kept high and dry. And you don't wanna overcrowd them. If you overcrowd them, you're running the risk of disease, and they begin to pick on each other. And then, of course, there's the water. You always want to keep it as clean as possible. That's why I use a natural product that has an enzyme in it that keeps algae and scum from building up in the water. This goes for chicks as well as adults, like these silver-laced Wyandots. 
Of course, one of the things that my friends who don't raise chickens ask about is, what about the odor? You know, it's not really that big a deal. What you want to do is you want to make sure that you keep your coop clean, all right? You want to have shavings in there that will absorb the moisture from their droppings. The other thing you can do is you can put an odor neutralizer over the shavings, which really helps. Now, think about this. Those shavings, as far as I'm concerned, are pure gold, particularly when they're mixed with the chicken droppings. Along with that odor neutralizer, and you combine that in your compost bin, you're gonna make pure gold for your plants and you won't believe how many vegetables you can grow. These are just a few tips on how to keep your chickens healthy and vibrant. And with that, you're gonna get a lot of delicious eggs. Heritage breeds aren't the only things needing the help of conservationists. Large trees like this big post oak at the farm, even though they've stood the test of time, they still are living things and are vulnerable. Weather, disease can bring them down. The Preservation Society of Newport County has started a special program to help preserve their local tree lines by replacing them with saplings taken from the elder trees themselves. We visited with them to see just how they're doing this. My name is Jeff Curtis. I'm the Director of Gardens and Grounds for the Preservation Society of Newport. I'm responsible for every blade of grass, every tree leaf, every petal on every flower. We also are in charge of decorating inside the houses, putting all the foliage plants inside. We grow a number of flowers to decorate inside the mansions with floral arrangements. We have a number of greenhouses that we take care of. We grow all the plants that we use in the mansions in our own greenhouses. So you, you can't be a specialist with this job. You have to know a little bit about everything. It's extremely challenging. You know, every day it's something else. For the most part, we stick to the original design of the landscape. We will not alter that unless we have to for some reason. We do the same thing with the buildings as we do with the grounds. You know, if the Great Hall and the Breakers needs to be painted, we're not gonna change the color. <laughs> Any time a specific tree dies, whether it's a European beech or a sugar maple or, or an elm, we stick to the exact same species of tree. One example where we do not stick to the same species is the American elm. It has the Dutch elm disease. I actually have a new variety of elm that I'm growing in this nursery. It's called Jefferson. Uh, it's a very good elm. The trees that we grow in our nursery, which is right behind me, are trees that are not readily available at local nurseries. Uh, there's one particular tree that we grow, it's called the uh, Turkish oak, which is native to uh, Western Europe. And uh, the first time we had to cut down a Turkish oak, this was about 25 years ago, first thing I had to do was to look up to see what nurseries grew the tree so I could buy one and replace it. But all went along. I searched all over the country and I could not find any. So the next step was to uh, collect the acorns from that particular tree and grow them ourselves. These mansions that you see around here, you don't see them anywhere else in the world, you know? For the most part, out in the main lawns and in, in the formal gardens, what you see today is what you saw a hundred years ago. You know what it feels like to get rid of clutter out of your house. For me, it gives me, well, a view into the future, it sort of clears my head. The same occurs with pruning. By pruning some of your shrubs and plants, well, it invigorates them, it tidies them up, makes them more productive. So why don't we take a look at a few principles that'll help you in your garden. Now the first principle with pruning is to follow the three Ds. Cut out diseased, dead, or damaged branches. Always follow this. It doesn't matter what kind of tree or shrub you're pruning, you wanna get rid of that stuff. It feels good to do it, and it feels good to the plant. All right, so you want to make that plant bloom more. You want it thicker and fuller. Think about this terminal bud. And what I wanna say about this, here we are in late winter and early spring, and you can see that bud already beginning to form. If you clip it there, what happens is it sends energy to these side buds, which will cause more limbs to grow this way. And if it's a flowering shrub, you're gonna increase the number of flowers you're producing. You're also going to thicken the shrub. Now this plant is one called burning bush, fireball. I love it. 
It's not really grown so much for its tiny little flowers, but it's grown for the extraordinary color that you get with its foliage in the fall. Now, another rule of thumb that you should always remember, if a plant blooms on old wood, wood produced from last year, you wanna wait until after it flowers before you prune it. A great example is our beloved old-fashioned forsythia. If you wait until those yellow flowers completely fade, that's when you want to prune it. The same holds with azaleas. Wait until your azaleas finish flowering, and as soon as they're finished, cut them back, and then they'll produce buds for next year. The thing you don't want to do is to prune them before they flower because you're going to cut off all those gorgeous flowers, and that's the whole reason you're growing these things. So do a little spring cleaning with your shrubs. They'll thank you for it. In fact, they'll reward you by producing lots of beautiful flowers in the season to come. Isn't that right? A little haircut doesn't hurt. Feels good, doesn't it? There you go. Outdoor living space, or should I say lack of, is one of the biggest challenges I hear from gardeners today. While containers are a great option for many, even that real estate can fill up quickly. Here's a new idea that's really taking off, growing on the vertical. My friend Dan Manji, owner of Manji's Landscape Companies in Bakersfield, California, shows us how he's applying vertical growing techniques on his job sites and the benefits to them. Dan, I gotta hand it to you. This has gotta be the ultimate camo job. I mean, it's just amazing. It's hard to believe that it's a <laughs> modular office or, or could have been a mobile home or it's, well, it could be a trailer. You know, you've totally camouflaged the thing with all these plants. I mean, this takes gardening on the vertical to new heights. I'm sure, it certainly does. And it takes it in a whole new way in a different direction as far as using established plants, plants that we both know right. so well and that most of your viewers would also be able to recognize. Sure, Dan, I really like what you've done over here with this wall of jasmine. That's for sure, it's, everybody's got a six foot fence or, or a, a mobile home or a, a, a RV that they would like to kind of disguise with. Right. And they yeah, think, well, the, res the yeah. restrictions are you can't go any higher than six feet. Right, so, with a fence. With a fence or a block wall. Right. So what it, uh, we've done here is taken a little less expensive, mm -hmm. again, tried and proven bread and butter plant right, that everybody's right. familiar with and this sure. is confederate jasmine right and you can see right there it's it's we've got eight foot uh and uh now exceeding that level of eight feet uh, just by providing the proper trellis and the proper planting medium you know one of the things here in your beautiful studio that caught my eye was your use of vertical but freestanding vertical, not in a wall, but in a, in a that big cylinder is fabulous. It's huge. It's, it's the largest freestanding in the Western United States right here in, in, in our studio. It's 18 feet tall and it is phenomenal. 27 tons of planting medium and there's <laughs> over 1,500 plants growing inside of it. So it's constantly changing because I see there are a lot of different things in there. So in the spring, some are gonna be blooming. In the fall, mm -hmm. you're gonna have great fall color. Well, you've been doing the vertical garden program for some time. Several years. We yeah. started out about five years ago, really playing with uh, different concepts and how to make it work and how to take it to a whole new level. The future of the garden is to, to address problems that are, you know, with the environment, the more plants that we can plant, the, uh, around our gardens, the better the air quality is sure. going to be. Sure, improves the ecosystem. And uh, we're going to cut dust. There's a lot of things that uh, that plants bring to us that uh, the vertical garden will really make a huge difference in anyone's garden. Yeah. As the population increases and abundant farmland continues to decline, people are turning to new technologies to grow food. Hydroponics is a great example. The fastest growing division of agriculture, hydroponics could feasibly command food production in the future. Tyler Barris, an indoor hydroponics farm manager at the Grow House in Denver, talks about some of the advantages. So hydroponics is actually not that new of a technology. They've been doing hydroponics since about the 60s, but it's been catching a new wave 
especially as urban farms are starting to take on hydroponics. And there's many reasons why they're doing this. One of the biggest is how quickly they grow. I've grown a crop, uh, a head of lettuce, hydroponically from seed to done in about 52 days. When you grow that same crop in dirt, it takes over three months. So for urban farms that are trying to really produce a lot of crops and actually be competitive with a, a full-size farm, hydroponics is a wonderful option. The other big advantage of hydroponics is the water savings. Hydroponics, you save about one-tenth the water that you would use to grow that same crop in the soil. So one-tenth of the water is huge. Now, it can vary depending on what systems exactly you're using and how you're, you're going about it and how, much, how well you're maintaining your system, but there's definitely water savings and faster growth, and you have a clean product at the end. A lot of the times you'll see in the store living lettuce in a clamshell, and these actually have the roots attached. These are grown in hydroponic systems, and that enables them to harvest them with the roots attached, wrap the roots, and then you actually have a crop that can last about a month after harvest cutting back on the end waste products. But a lot of this has a ton of research behind it now, and it's growing really quickly, just like the plants. You know, one of the easiest ways that I keep fresh flowers in my house through the winter months is lean on my good friend, the paper white Narcissus. Now, this variety of paper white is one called Ziva, and I really like it because it has marvelous aroma. Now, what I'm doing here is I'm actually creating a bed in this glass jar for these bulbs to grow in. You see, paper whites don't have to grow in soil. What I'm doing is something sort of stylish. Let's say you're going for something a little more modern, all black or all white. Here I've layered white beads, and now I'm going to add some of these black beads. And by taking several handfuls like this, you can see you can get sort of a layered effect. The main thing is just to have a little fun with it. There's just a few more here. And now I'm gonna finish it off with white. Okay, now it's just a matter of taking the third ingredient. The first ingredient was the jar, second, the glass beads, third, the bulbs. And all I'm gonna do is position these in just where the basal plate or the bottom of the bulb nestles into the glass beads. And you see I'm placing them where they're just almost touching. I like to pack them in. In this case, I've used seven bulbs. Now, these extra bulbs, I'll just keep in a cool, dry place. And what I'll do is I'll pull these out about every two weeks and plant another container so I have successive blooms throughout the winter, okay? Now all I have to do is add the fourth ingredient, and you guessed it, that's water. What you wanna do with the water is just fill the container up to where the water touches the base of the bulb. You don't want to completely submerge the bulbs in water. What they'll do is rot. Now what I've learned over the years by growing paper whites is that once you get to this point with them, you wanna place them in the room where they're away from direct light until they root in. That'll take about a week. You'll begin to see these white roots emerge. Once it's fully rooted in and they begin to push out some little green shoots, shift the container where it can get more light, maybe near a window, and watch them bloom. I've had paper whites bloom as early as three weeks after planting, or as long as six weeks. That just depends on how warm your house is and how close to light you have them. Give this a try, and hey, give your planting a decorative touch that matches your home decor. Are you interested in seeing the future a little more clearly? Well, I know I am. While technology may not allow us to see the future, it certainly can come in handy and make certain aspects of life a little more convenient. Oh, well maybe I do need to go water those little Roma tomatoes that I just planted. That's all the time we have for today's show. We'll catch you next time. I'm Alan Smith. Ah, yes, now I see. Ah, now I see, yes, it's becoming clear.
Yes, yes. Now I see it's becoming very clear. A chicken? Really? I think this thing is murky. Pink lemons? It's my side job. Do palm reading, do the cards, and do the van of white thing with it. P. Allen Smith's Garden Home is brought to you by Proven Winners. Proven Winners, found in their distinctive white containers at fine garden centers and the Home Depot. Aromatique, makers of decorative fragrances to create a distinct ambiance for each room in your home. More information at aromatique.com. Crescent Garden, designers and creators of functional decorative products for your home and garden. More information at crescentgarden.com. And by Bonnie Plants. When I was a kid, my dad grew so many vegetables and herbs that we had to give most of them away. As I got older, I realized he didn't give it away because he grew too much. He grew too much so that he could give it away. And by the makers of Job's Organic Fertilizer. Now in spikes, granular, and water-soluble formulas. EasyGardener.com. Your journey starts in Arkansas, the natural state. Vacation planning kits available at Arkansas.com or 1-800-NATURAL. More information about today's topic and other topics covered in this series can be found at PLNSmith.com.